So, hey, uh, good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening, wherever you are. I appreciate everybody jumping in. Um, just real quick, I'll introduce myself formally, since if you weren't there for the uh, for the pre-show banter, this is me. I'm Jerry Johansson. I'm the principal at uh, a small little company that that uh, I do on the side here at IR Proactive, and uh, I have been in the field for gosh now almost 20 years i was talking before my background i got started in law enforcement for about a decade worked uniform and then transitioned over into a detective and federal agent position focused really on digital forensics and incident response there and then made the transition into the private sector you know, almost uh almost a decade ago in terms of background, it's, that's really the big three that I've, I've been involved in, Threat Intel, Digital Forensics, and Incident Response. And uh, I am in Rapid City, South Dakota. So if you're coming out for Wild West Hacking Fest and you land at the, well, let's call it an airport, but it's not really an airport. It's just a room that planes can uh, let passengers out. So uh, beautiful uh, section of uh, South Dakota. I always tell people if you're going to Wild West Hacking Fest and you've never been, tack on an extra day, go see some sites. You know, the Rapid City, especially in October, is a is a great is a great time of year to to pop around there. So, really want to leave everybody here with at least something to walk away with. If all you do is walk away and say, "Hey, we may have to look at how we do things from a process standpoint, tooling standpoint, really around incident response, how we respond to detections, what forensics tools we we use." Really, I start with a problem statement, and I'm going to get into the why. Why we're talking here and why I actually developed a, a two-day coursework around this problem. The problem is, as of, is the speed with which our threat actors are, are moving. We're looking from initial execution. Let's look at what's going on right now where we see threat actors dumping a, you know, a one-note file that contains malicious code in it. That's their initial foothold. And then we're seeing a full execution measured in hours. This is um, really kind of one of the problems in this realm. And what we want to do is look at our processes to deal with this. We also have a continual redevelopment of TTPs. I brought up uh, one of them was the, the you know, malicious OneNote file, but you know, here we have TTPs that move from macros to market the web attacks, where we're actually mounting an ISO and executing right from there. The speed issue comes up. We have a combination of scripted and hands-on, and that's always a, a an issue. Is really figuring out what's actually threat actor behavior from their processes and what are they actually scripting. And uh, honestly, even the best defenses don't work 100 percent of the time. You know, even even with EDR and XDR and you know all of the the different detection and response tools out there, threat actors still continue to get in there. And we really can't wait for a full response sometimes. And we'll talk about that real quick too. We generally don't have a luxury now that I was brought up with in, in my transition into doing this from an enterprise standpoint. Uh, law enforcement is not, as, not the best at crisis-driven action in terms of digital forensics and incident response. Uh, so we had a lot of luxury of time. If we had a, a case, white collar crime case, and we would have two months to actually dig through two or three laptops from, from the suspect. That's not the reality here. And it's the same thing in enterprise. The kind of modality that we used for, for a very long time in, in the external IR teams, you know, me being one of those, was a customer would call up and say, hey, we, I think we got a problem. They generally do it on a Friday afternoon, even though they've been dealing with it for two days. And you know, they'd want to engage services. And then it goes to the lawyers to review the contract. And now all of a sudden you have this day, day and a half as a threat actor is actively rooting around your environment, mapping drives and, and starting to deploy ransomware. Even in the best case of scenario where you have uh, service level agreements or service level objectives from those providers, you know, for example, a service level objective is something that's actually not written into a contract. It's our best effort. It's going to be four hours. Sometimes even with like zero cost retainers, 
hey, we can, uh, you know, we'll give you a zero cost retainer. We'll pick up the phone. They'll pick up the phone and then say, okay, we'll be there in 48 hours. We can't do that anymore. So uh, really what we have is we need to deal with kind of a, a, a way to at least get some breathing room. So maybe we do have to do this. So for example, what, what we're going to talk about a little later is, hey, if I just do this in the first 90 minutes, then I have some breathing room to make some decisions, to pull in some external resources. And it's basically like getting the fire under control and then calling you know, the fire department versus calling the fire department and waiting 20, 30 minutes. The big question to ask if you're doing any type of business wargaming or tabletop exercises is in the time it takes for everyone to get aligned, meaning you declare an incident, how long average does it take to get everybody on a Zoom call and start making some movement and decisions around that process? Then ask yourself, what is the damage we could suffer? What could actually happen in the 90 minutes to two hours it takes on a Saturday morning at 3 a.m. for the entire incident response team to be up and running, ready to go? What does the damage look like? Four or five years ago, we may, may, may have had that time, but unfortunately right now, these things are so quick that even that two hours could, could mean the difference between maybe having to re-image 50 systems or doing a complete n- network rebuild because everything's been bricked with lockbit. So what can we do? Well, what we are moving towards, I think, what I think we should move towards is getting those forensic techniques that focus really on on four key areas, initial access, uh, execution, lateral movement, and command and control. And I'm pulling these directly from the MITRE ATT&CK framework and uh, just make some allusions to what we're doing from a classwork or training perspective is that's what we map our tactics and techniques against. It is probably the best resources that we have there. What are we also doing is we're turning incident response and forensics into a decision support is what we need to do for our customer, so to speak, being senior leadership, the CIO, maybe the CISO, maybe the chief risk officer and and definitely the CEO is give them some real definitive information on the circumstances that we're facing and then allow them to make some decisions. So some of the things to, to think about there. Finally, we're really focused on IR process into really kind of two broad processes is identification and contain. So we want to identify and contain. We just want to figure out what the threat actor did from those those four uh, tactics and then contain it. That gives us the actual wiggle room, maybe some breathing room to do a full-blown investigation and then figure out how to expel them from the network. And that means taking care of things like persistence. Uh, Maybe they've got embedded malware and registry files, something of that nature. But as opposed to trying to do that first, what we need to do is identify and contain. So when we're looking at this, when I say forensics, is there's really a difference. And it, and it really goes to kind of what our, our objectives and goals are. Oftentimes, we do a lot of digital forensics work or computer forensics work or whatever the case may be, however you want to, to wrap it in a, in a rubric. But really we have three broad categories. We have computer forensics, and oftentimes this is what law enforcement, maybe even some e-discovery and uh, private investigators are focused on. This is the dead box forensics. This is we pull a drive, we image the drive, we then go keyword search, we look for files. If it's a white collar crime, we're looking for Excel or, or other spreadsheets. It's a detailed process, but the big thing is time is on our side. We may have somebody identified that we're going to try to put in front of a, a, a judge, whether it's a civil case or a criminal case, but uh, we have time. What is digital forensics, really? Is that's that we're taking that computer forensics and extending it out. So this is where you get network forensics. This is where we may do malware analysis. Again, we have processes that deal with this, but most likely we're not necessarily facing a civil or criminal court system, we're really kind of giving some insight to our leadership of what this actually, what 
the threat actor actually did. So we moved from where computer forensics is, we need to put somebody behind a keyboard to this is what the threat actor did in our environment and what they have done and what our response was. Then we go over to enterprise forensics. This is a, a combined analysis, just like digital forensics, very heavily reliant on plans and playbooks. But the big thing is time is short. And really, the answer uh, question that we ask that we're trying to answer is how's the threat actor operating and how can we kick them out? And that's really kind of what our focus really is going to be there. So here are some of the tools that we will look at you know, in the, in the coursework, but also from an everyday perspective that we're focused on. There's four of them that are essentially our forensic backbone. Well, we make heavy use of, in, especially in the initial 60 minutes, tools like Easy Tools, Eric Zimmerman's tools, uh, CAPE, uh, the Kroll Artifact and Parser Extractor. Zeek as kind of our, our network uh, tool, not necessarily from an IDS IPS sensor perspective, but more from, can we use this to actually cut through some packet capture? And then finally, Velociraptor. We throw in Red Team, uh, Atomic Red Team as, a, as a, another tool, more from, hey, how can we build out not just the tool set, but how do we emulate threats so that we can actually have a construct to work through our processes. So one of the outcomes that I uh, set out to do from this testing perspective was how can we emulate threats to give people realistic evidence and that they can practice these skills continually without actually having to uh, actually build up their own infrastructure on cyber range, they can actually do this on an endpoint. So what do we talk about really in that first 60 to 90 minutes is a triage approach. And what is the triage approach? If we think about from the medical perspective, what a triage is, is identifying who's savable and who isn't. Who's actually able to be saved, who's far gone, and what their conditions are. It is a quick patient assessment. We're determining if the resources meet the ability or, or meet the need or meet the, the goal of saving their lives. So for example, if somebody is slightly injured, we don't necessarily have to do anything with them. We kind of let them sit for two hours and then focus on, on the, more, the more critical areas that people have injuries. In the incident response context, what we want to do is we're going to do that pass. We're quickly analyzing the key artifacts, again, those big four initial access execution, lateral movement, command and control to see if they've been compromised. If they have been compromised, then the, then we move into more of a, of a decision cycle to say, do we need to take this offline? Is it okay to be compromised as long as it's executing its core function and data is not at risk? But the key here is getting a good look around four distinct distinct tactics to really kind of drive some of those decisions forward. And what, what do we do from an analysis? Well, most of the evidence is contained on less than 1% of the disk. What we need is very, very minor compared to the entire, let's say you've got a laptop that's got you know, a terabyte SSD on. When you think about what operating system files are necessary to triage, we're talking less than 1% of the disk. If we can get quick assessment, we can get those initial access, execution, and command and control. We can also maybe get lateral movement. We'll talk a little bit about where that fits in, but those are three of the big tactics and techniques that we can generally get off of the disk. I throw lateral movement in there because there are some things that you may be able to parse for SMB or RDP traffic from the Windows event logs or the, the Windows RDP logs, but uh, you know, really. If we can get these three, we're, we're, we're in really solid shape. Our first goal is to stop the attacker's access and pivot co to containment. So containment is the big stage. We want to basically get that breathing room. Uh, that means network access. So that is that command and control portion. How are they getting into and out of from their externally controlled environment into our environment? Very important. 
the next lateral movement. How are they moving east and west? And how do we contain that? Right? You think about the majority of, of, of threat actors that are delivering ransomware. You see a combination of compromised credentials and something like SMB or PS exec. And uh, they're actually just moving that code that way. If they're using a, a post-exploitation framework such as Cobalt Strike, uh, something to, to be considered as well. And then finally, credential use. This is often overlooked just as an aside in terms of containment strategies. So if you're doing a TTX at some point in the near future, think about, hey, asking a question, well, if we identify a, a, a domain or administrative level credential, what's our process for containing that use? So how do we triage? Well, this is the, 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 you know, one of the, the key questions here. I've written scripts. There's a lot of scripts out there whether they're Bash, PowerShell, that essentially go out and pull documents and pull artifacts off, off a system. There's others like uh, Silar, unfortunately no longer, no longer supported, I believe, but other tools like Kate that are specifically designed to go out and grab very specific files for that triage process. Something I highly don't recommend is manual extraction because it doesn't scale. And then one of the key aspects to enterprise is locally versus remote. So I'll leave it up to everybody here, which one scales and which one doesn't. Locally is good for small works, all right? This is the sneaker net. You hand somebody a USB with your, your triage tool on there to go gather and maybe do some analysis right there on site. This is often small, localized. Maybe you've got one you know, part of a campus that's got an issue. Remotely scales across a large enterprise, but we also need the capability to, to have that in, in as a tool set. So this is what EDRs do. This is what, for example, we're going to look at Velociraptor, is we need the capability to actually go out and reach every system. We're going to identify some of these key artifacts and analytics in our our Kind of a mantra to think about is we want to alert. So we take an alert from a system, whether it's human generated or computer generated alert. We go out and collect, analyze, and then we pivot. Pivot can either be into a process such as containment, or maybe we have to augment some additional analysis, but this is what we're doing. Very clear process, very quick. One of the things that I didn't really talk about is the stress that you might feel during. And one of the key aspects to, to what I'm talking about today in terms of triage is that these are processes that you want to have ironed out and cracked. So talking about alert, collect, analyze, pivot, it sounds very, very simple. And it's like, well, okay, that's, that's really simple, Jerry. It's like, well, here's the problem is when you're in that stress, when, you're, when, when things are on fire, Simple actually just generally works better for that perspective. So a lot of what we're focusing on is keeping processes very simple with a very simple, clear objective. And obviously, I've said it before, you could probably make it a drinking game at this point as triage, the output is focused on that containment and having those discussions. We talked about you know, how we do this and, and why we're doing this. Let's talk about what we're doing. What are we actually looking for? Some of the things we'll actually look at at grabbing master file table, and this is a good piece of of data to have, or or a good artifact to have if you have a rough date and time of when something's dropped. If you think about the master file table and how many entries there are in the master file table, there's a lot of data. So just diving in, it's very much like the registry. A lot of people people that are that do registry forensics. Are, are really good at detailing and, and getting some real understanding about how threat actors leverage the registry. In this context, we leave the registry out because unless it's being used for execution and we can see those registry rights in something else, we don't necessarily have a good pivot point within the registry to go deep diving in there. The prefetch files, if you have them, Virtual systems will have them, uh, sometimes Windows 10 systems, depending on the organization, it's not by default. So 
If you have them, really good. User journal, Shimcash and Amcash. Really, if you think about it, these are the, these are where we're pulling our initial access from that master file table. Maybe we can see a PowerShell script, a DLL loaded, a OneNote file, template dropped on a system. Event logs, if we can get them. All right. A lot of organizations uh, may not have event logs going in, everything coming into a SIM. So we are actually going to have to pull and extract those as part of a triage package. Uh, it's very rare. I found it very rare for endpoints in large organizations, 5,000, 6,000 endpoints to pull into Splunk, because that's a pretty big check you're writing to Splunk. But that doesn't mean we, we overlook event logs. We can pull them from the system and they will tell us a lot of what, what is happening. And then uh, syslog, correction, I'm sorry, that's not supposed to be syslog. That's supposed to be sy system monitor. But uh, ID1 for execution, and then what we're doing from executables identified. We want to see what, what's executing in particular. So right now, we'll kind of walk through you know, what this is going to look like, and then I'll do a short demo and then take a lot of questions. I think I, I see some questions right there. So this is a really basic green because we're using a lot of Velociraptor. I actually color code my workflows based on tools and Velociraptor's green. So a lot of this is going to be green. And really what we're looking to do here is we're coming off an alert we go to our, our triage workflow, and then we work on our basic collection. And then what we are trying to determine is, do we have a prefetch? And if we have a prefetch, we analyze the prefetch. If we don't have the prefetch, we're going to go ahead and analyze Syspawn. Very, very quick workflow. One of the topics that we do work through in the two-day program is where all of this fits into workflows, playbooks, because as I stated before, it's often overlooked. And when things are highly stressful, it can get really, really, really convoluted. And you're not going to be able to remember everything. Having it written down in a nice little workflow really does help. What we'll walk through, just to kind of give everybody a quick understanding, then we'll go into the demo. And really what I want to pay attention to in the demo is how quickly this can actually be accomplished, how we can actually pivot into some data. So we're going to use Velociraptor as our tool. And what Velociraptor does is it has uh, specific files that you can actually write or actually go out to the website that are either included or are available as, a, as an open source project that will actually do all of your extractions written in what's called uh, Velociraptor query language. And uh, not necessarily a very difficult language to understand, uh, but more it's the capability is, is much, much more, I would say, much more robust than even just some of the, the other systems out there from an EDR perspective. We're going to use the Cape Files targets. We're going to pivot off of that and then go into a basic collection. So here is the basic collection we looked at in the workflow, for example is this is just a portion of all of that data that we're looking for. Again, going back to that 1%, you know, all of the data that we're looking for is contained on 1% of the drop. And we'll actually, when you look at how big this file is, it's only about 800 meg compressed down to, I think about 150, but we'll see that. This is what we're actually collecting. And you can see a lot of different a lot of different things that we could even pare down to the point of just extracting key data points. But for purposes of the demonstration, there is a lot of data here. There's also the ability to use other triage packages. There's multiple triage packages that we could, we could leverage here in terms of SANS, CAPE, all of this. And we'll, we'll walk through a little bit more on that perspective. But you can see a definitive trend here of what they're actually grabbing in terms of CAPE. CAPE is specifically targeted for the, the parsing and extraction part of CAPE. This is doing the access and, and then actually taking a look at, at uh, the evidence. You can see more Chrome stuff. This is really good for some of those web-based attacks. But we still have a lot of data here that we can leverage. 
So let's go ahead and uh, I'm gonna go ahead and pop out of here real quick. Thanks for watching. Don't miss part two of this series coming up next.